Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. At the California Institute of Thank you. Is the sound okay? Is it all right? All right. Um, I was just thinking what a wonderful sound system you have. We've been trying to record some of ours, haven't we, Annie? And um, we don't have something so effective. <laughs> so this is, this is quite wonderful. Um, I just wanted to also introduce my partner, Ann Hershey. Um, she accompanied me this morning, and I wanted to respect the fact that I know this is a gay men's space, but I thought I could bring my partner, right, especially since it's Hal Hershey's sister. So <laughs> she has double like recommendation here. <laughs> right, we should. Not a very gay man. That's really interesting. My root teacher, it's funny you said that. My root teacher is uh, Ruth Dennison, and um, she's very lesbian friendly. And um, we made her an honorary lesbian at one point. <laughs> so is this is a good thing. So I thought what I would do was just speak for a little while about um, an issue that is sort of like one of our hot topics at the Lesbian Buddhist Sangha. Um, I've talked about it before there in different ways, and um, whenever there's question and answer about almost anything, it seems to me this kind of thing comes up a lot. Um, and basically, I, I title it uh, Sex, Joy, and Equanimity, the Love Life of a Lesbian Buddhist. <laughs> um, but really, it's all the issues that come up around the words desire, passion, you know, things like that for, for us as... Um, gay men and lesbian women, um, and the questions that come up in the women's mind as we practice together, and the contradictions they think they, they hear or they feel about some of these issues. So I thought I would share some of um, what's come up for us and some of my thoughts about all this. And of course, we'll have time for talking about it all. You know, the Dharma starts off that without question, we all want to be happy. Right, that was one of the first things that I heard, and I thought, oh, that's right, good. <laughs> I want to be happy. Um, and that we don't want to suffer, and that we have a right you know, to happiness, and um, that we don't necessarily have to suffer, and here's the path to our liberation from suffering. Those words to me were like um, kind of diamonds, you know, jewels. Um, but the trick, of course, lies in this issue about pleasure. Because I think for most of us, you know, happiness and pleasure are closely equated, or at least in our culture, that's certainly what we think about. You know, if we can, if we can get pleasure, then we'll be happy. Um, but as I'm sure some of you who practice know, um, this pursuit of pleasure, of course, is um, sort of um, like an illusory kind of a game, right? That the pursuing of pleasure, especially if it's done earnestly, <laughs> which, um, which, you know, I, no blame, it's just what we do, um, gets us hung up. Because in fact, what, what are we taught and what are we have discovered? The law of impermanence, that any kind of pleasurable object or experience will, in fact, because of its nature, its very essence, change. Right? And it doesn't mean it will change like next year or something. It means that it, it's, its very essence is, is elusive and changing at this very moment. So to try to hold on to it, even for longer than a second in my experience, um, tries to solidify it and therefore um, you, know, you suffer because, of course, it's in the process of changing. So that's one way of understanding the dilemma. Um, we can see how human life, I think, is driven by unfulfilled desires. It's actually a very sad thing in some ways, desires that people get really fixated to. And I feel very um, compassionate about this for myself and all of us because, in fact, that's what we're taught. You know, we're taught to get it, 
you know, to get the money or the car or the house or the girlfriend or the boyfriend. Or, and then we'll be happy. Um, and I think as some of us have discovered, it doesn't work that way exactly. So then comes the question, at least that I'm asked a lot, something like this. So does this mean that we should not know pleasure, right? That we shouldn't know joy, that we maybe shouldn't even have a good time? <laughs> you know, these, these things come up a lot. And of course, um, the answer is no, that it's fine. But what's necessary, really, is to figure out how we can come in to right relationship, I guess is the way I would put it, with some of these expressions, like our desire for pleasure, um, our need for happiness. You know, how, how can we come into right relationship with desire, for example, which is one of the bottom line issues. So let's take it right into a loving relationship, because that's where it seems to come up a lot for the lesbian women that I work with anyway, or you could apply it to anything. But let's say relationship. So it is said that it's necessary to practice um, renunciation. There's another buzzword, I find. Um, especially within um, right relationship or relationship. But what is understood from that is that we, we need to be renouncing ourself. In other words, we need to be renouncing the need for wanting things to be the way we want them to be, right? That's the kind of desire that I understand is the first hindrance or one of the five hindrances in the practice. It's the kind of clinging desire, right? In fact, you'll sometimes see it written rather than desire craving, which to me is much more an accurate expression, I think, of where our problems are. Um, clinging already you know, indicates the solidification, the hanging on, right? Or desire is kind of, well, I, I like something. You know, it's a little more open, open. So I often, when I teach the five hindrances, talk about craving, not so much desire, because people get confused, including myself. Um, but really what we're talking about is being willing to give up our self-centered desire, um, let's say in this case for our beloved, for we wanting them to be who we need them to be, right? or needing to get what we want from them. It's been my experience, and I've been in this relationship for 12 years, which um, I bow to very deeply because it's been quite an honor and a privilege to be given this gift. Um, the fact that every morning I wake up and Annie's really a different person. <laughs> I mean, she's the same person, but she's not the same person, you know. <laughs> And I'm wanting the same loving face, you know what I mean, or um, the same funny time or whatever we had when we went to sleep. And it, it may not always be there, not necessarily because of her, maybe because of me. Of course it's not going to be there, because it will have changed. Maybe to something better, if I can be open to it, but certainly not what was going on, let's say, a few hours earlier. Um, this can be a tremendous confusion, I think, or it certainly is in my life. Um, I desire her, I desire happiness in the relationship, but I have to open up to the fact that, well, you know, I desire life as it is, and life's nature, you know, is to change and to be very mostly faceted. In a way, I've found that I can't depend on her, and I don't mean depend on her ultimately, I can depend on her as a partner, but I mean depend on her to be who I need. You know what I mean? And gratify my, my, me in some way. Any more than I can depend on my own body, right? Because I think for as we get older or we get ill or whatever happens to us, we're very aware that things we depended on sometimes aren't there for us physically. Any more than I can depend on the weather, right? That these are just natural phenomena of change. And I, I really try to open my heart to this. So really... Um, Annie is kind of a mystery from the get-go, you know, even after 12 years. And if I can open to that, then I, I can open to the expression of desire and love, right? And it's more natural, appropriate state. Another consideration um, that comes up a lot around desire and relationship and things for, for us is um, this issue of commitment. Um, 
and some of you may be familiar with some um, teachings like from Thich Nhat Hanh or others that have said that loving relationship is perhaps mostly appropriate in a committed kind of situation, whatever that means, right? <laughs> but let's say long-term commitment or something. Um, but the truth of the matter, again, is that life is impermanent. And I won't give you another lecture, but you know what I'm saying, that we hope if things are going pretty well for us, that the relationship will last a while, maybe even a long time. Um, however, we also know that um, the nature of existence is a Nietzsche impermanence and that anything can happen at any time. So how do we live with this, with an open heart? I have found that perhaps um, making a commitment to love, the energy of love, the expression of love, just, just love, Rather than trying to make a commitment to a person, you know, or an idea of how that should be, um, not that I don't commit to the person, but what I mean is to who that person is, to the solidified idea that this is the person, because the person will change. So if I just make a commitment to love, um, then I'm ready, right? I'm ready for who that person might be and the way that love might express itself today, which might be a little different than yesterday. And this is, of course, true for all relationships. Somehow making a commitment to openness and appreciation and wonder, right? A more open-hearted kind of commitment. And this is a commitment I think I could try to be true to, right? No matter what happens in my life or what happens with my partner in this case. So we're still kind of stuck, I think, with this word desire, though. Because it's so much in the Dharma. Um, desire has also um, been called the working basis for compassion, which I think is more the way that the Dharma is steering us, again, rather than the desire for self-gratification or what we need, but more just kind of a a desire for good in general and for compassion. Well, look at the word compassion, right? A very charged word stuck in there. <laughs> Passion, the other one. The minute, the minute we start talking about desire, a lot of times someone will say, well, what about passion and, you know, that, <laughs> that grabbing onto your girlfriend kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we really have to honor that. That's who we are. You know, that's the life force, right, within us. It's the clinging to it and needing it to be the same where we get hung up. So desire in some way, if you think of it this way, through compassion, actually becomes a kind of an empathy, I would say, if you like, um, a desire for well-being, right, for the partner, for ourselves, for all of us, for our community. So I have come to understand this desire that's talked about in the Buddha and uh, in the Buddhist terms, and perhaps this is somewhat limited, but I found it helpful. When it comes up, to think of it as a habitual, self-centered response. You know, that, that issue of conditioning. You know, oh yeah, I want that. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Very, very mundane, happens instantly all the time. And that that kind of desire is the root of my suffering. It's also said, um, the kind of desire that is really the fuel for compassion, it's said that that kind of desire is really the fuel for the bodhisattva path, right? So these are not simple issues, you know. It's the, it's the fire and the drive of Kuan Yin, the desire, you know, while she wants to hear all our cries of misery <laughs> because she wants so badly for our happiness and for our healing. That's a kind of desire, right? So as I said, I think that desire, and particularly passion, um, is really a zest for life. It's a connection word. It's about being with the beauty of all, is the unique appreciation, right, of every moment that, that I think we, we try to cultivate in our practice. And then that brings me to joy. Because I notice that when I feel that kind of zest for life, and I sort of feel really kind of giddy, <laughs> happy, um, joyful. Um, 
I'll tell you a little story. We had our first uh, weekend residential retreat um, lately in the Lesbian Buddhist Sangha. And it was wonderful. It was powerful. It was just a marvelous thing. There were 30 of us. We did, we did just great. But the one issue that came up that people were worried about was the somberness of our experience together. And again, uh, we're a mixed sangha in a sense that I think you are. We, we tend to have practitioners from different traditions you know, on the outside. So there was a guideline given by a Zen practitioner, <laughs> and she talked a lot about averting the eyes. You know, and not looking at each other. Well, this is lesbian nation. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's all about hugging and you know. Um, and there were some, of course, that understood this and put it in a context. But though I'd say at least half the people were a little put off by this, and actually saddened by it. You know, they, they were fairly, um, I thought, very skillful in the way they handled it. They didn't really get into a strong aversion and anger or anything like that. But I could see there was kind of this bummer energy, you know, a little too somber, you know. And after the first evening, we had a little caucus. We talked about it. And, and then it came out in the, in, the, in the support groups, you know, how people were feeling. And so we offered some suggestions about it, and we're working with it. So I won't go off on to that. But um, my personal feeling is that um, joy is very much of our practice. And, of course, it's a skillful expression of joy, and it's not about taking us out of our bodies and off into fantasies about each other, but it certainly is about appreciation. You know, and I think the women were so happy to be there together and so, you know, self-congratulatory that we'd pull this off. You know, they were just glowing, and they wanted to look at each other, and, you know, and um, people would go, So there were some misunderstandings about this. So I think it's worth looking at. You know, how can we express joy in a dharmic manner? Um, I find that joy replenishes me, the kind of joy we're talking about. I feel like it's a health-giving phenomenon. It increases my capacity to sit and to practice. It doesn't, doesn't seem to get in the way. As you know... Uh, there's a biological effect on the immune system with, with, with the experience of joy. So this is also a healing thing as well. Um, I'd say a joyful practice nurtures gratitude and appreciation, right, and generosity, which are all part of, you know, very much part of the Dharma. And actually, <clears throat> I don't know what your sitting experience has been, but for me... Um, when I have good concentration and samadhi is, is happening for me, I feel joy. I mean, in, in the context of the Dharma, I, I don't want to get up and raise a flag or anything like that, but I, I do feel a kind of a deep appreciation and joy, you know, for myself and for the practice, which is it's quite wonderful. It's also said that there's no experience um, that justifies the closing of the heart Forget which teacher told me that, but I have that, you know, as one of my things I stick up in my room. Um, there's no experience that justifies the closing of the heart, which its corollary would be, of course, that the expression of joy helps us, you know, maintain an open heart. So. What will help us establish this ability to live with passion and zest for life, but without this conditioned self-focus, this this thing about ourselves? Well, I think, for me, you can look all over, you know, the Dharma, but I found that equanimity, the fourth um, of the divine abodes, of the four, you know, emotional qualities that the Buddha said are actually the only emotions worth cultivating, I often say that when I give a talk about them because it wakes everybody up. (laughs) What? (laughs) Um, And the fourth, being sort of the most mysterious, I think, or the most elusive or potentially confusing again for our culture. I could do a whole talk on that, but I wanted to mention it because I feel like the cultivation of this equanimity is perhaps the hint or the tool or, or, or good way of staying in joy and happiness and desire 
um, without attaching to it too much because that's what equanimity is about, right? It's appreciation. It's being present. It's not a cold detachment about not caring about anything. It just doesn't have the craving. It doesn't have the attachment. It doesn't have, from my experience, the I focus, right? So it is about being present. Equanimity is not a cool thing. And cold, certainly. But it is... Um, its cultivation is about not grabbing into the experience and then also not detaching from it, at least according to the way I understand it. It's not about detaching. It's not about attaching. It's just being. Okay. Well, very high challenge, right? <laughs> but it is an interesting hint around some of these words about passion and desire, how to be passionate in caring about someone or something or even the chocolate cake. <laughs> You know, and um, at the same time, bring a little equanimity into the experience. My, that really helps me diet. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it really does. You know, because my experience, like you know, any kind of food person, is you know, three, you know, three scoops of ice cream are better than one. You know, <laughs> I mean, if it's good. <laughs> and so it's, you know, the equanimity of it. Just to get into the middle a little and, and try to do one and, and see how great that can be. Not because I'm trying to discipline myself or beat myself up, because I want to be free from suffering. And I know that if I indulge myself too much, well, the ice cream is really obvious, <laughs> but even in other more subtle things, that I will become attached and I will want it to be that way a lot, you know, and then it won't be. And anyway, the ice cream, you know, by the third scoop, isn't really quite as good as that first one sometimes, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know what your experience is, but by that time you're sort of... <laughs> <laughs> okay, a word about sex. <laughs> I have to go there. Uh, and I knew that I'd get a good audience here. <laughs> Sometimes you say that and everybody goes, oh. Yeah, this is good. Um, so how can I work this in? Well, um, you know, in contemplating this and... Um, I could talk, sort of apply sex to a lot of what I've said already about bringing more of an equanimous attitude towards it, um, you know, not needing it to be the way we want it to be. You know, I mean, in sex education workshops, they'll tell you that, you know. Don't go with high expectations, just be there for the experience. Um, but I think that if we talk about orgasm, this might be even more interesting, at least for me. And as I was thinking about bringing this out here, because I haven't brought it out in a gay men's circle, um, I thought, well, I don't know, though. I mean, who knows whether my experience of orgasm with a woman is going to be similar to a man's experience with a man or a straight person, with a, you know, whatever, you know. I mean, just, I mean, biophysiologically, I imagine it's quite similar, I think. <laughs> but, you know, we're not just bodies, we're minds and hearts, you know, so... I don't know, but I'm just going to go with what my experience has been with women and the way we talk about it. Um, through lovemaking and giving this way to each other, it's my experience that I kind of fall through a door or I fall into something at orgasm. Um, it's in a mysterious event, right? I have been lately trying to track it more, trying to bring attention or awareness to this experience. Um, Annie knows this. so <laughs> um, Not just for my personal gratification to really get into it, although I have to admit that does happen, <laughs> um, but just to know it, right, more deeply. So it seems mysterious. Um, at the moment, if I can contact it, that this is happening, the interesting, one interesting thing to me is that this I business drops away. Now, maybe that's already been happening through the, the sexual experience to some degree, but not always, quite frankly, depending on what act we're doing and how it's going. And I won't get any more explicit. <laughs> but I've noticed that there's certain things um, or certain acts in sexuality that I, positions, whatever, that I may do that are a little more I assertive or I feel my sense of myself more strongly, and others perhaps not. But regardless, when this orgasm thing happens, I, I do notice that, that that floats away no matter what I've been doing. <laughs> um, 
Um, that's interesting to me, especially from our perspective. There's supposed to be so much about not identifying with the I, you know, solid sense of self. Well, what happens? Well, I feel like the word dissolve is appropriate. And you'll hear this word in Dharma talks, probably. Um, I heard something from Kabbalah Masters, a tape the other day, that said, dissolving into the sense of life, dissolving into life. You know, that was like her practice. Very much an interconnection practice. Well, I thought it fit my experience at orgasm. You know, because as we lose the sense of solid self, right, we don't just disappear or something. You know, we don't not exist anymore, right? Well, what is it? Well, I think we, I move into my true awareness of who I really am, which is, in fact, this interconnected being with every molecule, not only of my lover, but of the room and the bed and the candle and probably the whole world <laughs> in that moment. Maybe that's going too far, but I, I think something like that might be happening. So now if I think about that, then I think, well, this whole thing about, um, you know, we beat ourselves up a little about wanting orgasm. <laughs> I, don't know about, I don't know about your community, but in the lesbian community, there's, you know, if I have an orgasm, fine. If I don't have an orgasm, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> And this is good. I mean, of course, we're about an exchange. But I was just trying to think as I'm talking that, well, maybe that's sort of like an intuitive um, wish for dissolution, you know, or intuitive wish for certainly connection in a spiritual way with a partner, but maybe even beyond that. It's just, just stuff to speculate about or think about. Um, and then there's the moment of returning or the moments of returning, you know, after this dispersive experience or whatever. Um, I experience a kind of a coming back to myself. Oh. <laughs> so am I re-solidifying in the same way that I was earlier? Maybe not. I'm not sure. I've been watching it. But there's a, there's a minute or two where I feel different. I feel kind of more open. Right? I feel very loving. I feel somewhat something like after sitting on a retreat. <laughs> I mean, this may not be exactly the same, but I, it's just interesting to think about, I think. Um, and so I look at the terms. It seems to me that in the letting go of myself and even my beloved at that moment that I reach some kind of ecstatic state of oneness um, and all these terms about letting go right, opening up are all, are all what we're trying to get to um, in our practice so it's it's just something to I just challenge you to think about it or experiment with it and by the way, you can be by yourself. You don't have to be with somebody else. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add a couple of things that famous people said, because I always think that's, that's great. Um, Dogen said that it's um, really important to look at intimacy, and that in fact, true intimacy, or let's say true enlightenment, really, True enlightenment is to be intimate with all of our experience. You know? Um, I like that a lot because it encompasses the whole spectrum of what we're talking about. And I brought Sharon Salzberg. For those of you who don't know her, she's a Theravadan Vipassana teacher, great renown. And um, she's just kind of a specialist in the four divine abodes or that kind of practice so when I, when I talk about equanimity I, I use her teachings a lot and um, she talks about equanimity in this way it's a state of peace to be able to accept things as they are this is to be at home with our own lives and I would say with our own relationships we see that this universe is too big for us to hold on to, but it is the perfect size for letting go again. <laughs> Our hearts and minds can become that big, and we can actually let go. This is the gift of equanimity. And then there's a Chinese poem that she quotes in here, and she doesn't give an author, unfortunately. But I think it's quite beautiful because my practice is actually quite nature-related and nature-based. And 
I think that we can find a lot of Dharma through nature. 10,000 flowers in spring, the moon in autumn, a cool breeze in summer, and snow in winter. If your mind is not clouded by unnecessary things, this is the best season of your life. So thank you. And discussion. <laughs> I, I was taken by um, your earlier comment about you know the serious nature of the retreat and some concern about it might be a, a lack of joyful expression. Um, and and you know, that's, that's an issue that, that I uh, that. That I think about a lot too in this particular path that I'm taking because I, I, I know you don't have Buddhist gospel songs. I, I mean, it, it, you, don't, you don't have like like this, this is really physical exuberance about about the, the joy of living and, and, and the wonder of it all right. uh, that, that you do in some of the Christian sects. And um, um, it, it does seem kind of subdued. And I I, uh, I wonder how how you, how you deal with that issue. In the, well, as you heard, I'm trying to deal with it. I'm actually quite concerned about it yeah. from, from our perspective of my particular sangha. Um, again, because I think there's, there's some of us that are kind of more ready for that and others that feel it's somehow sacrilegious. And I think it's a big issue because I'll just take my teacher, Ruth Dennison, who I think is a master at this. Um, she can have us dancing around the room in veils, you know what I mean, dressed up for Halloween. <laughs> And still be practicing, you know. And to me, that's the key. You know, as a teacher, that's what I want to learn how to do. I want to be able to help us all, you know, in any experience, but particularly in joy and dance and movement or any of these things, be able to use that same focus, that same awareness practice, you know. Um, we have walking meditation, <laughs> at least, you know, which is sort of a movement in that direction. She also teaches mindful movement. And so is Arena, and so do I, and so does Julie Wester, some of the people in Ruth's tradition. So that's a step in that direction. But even that is, move your arm. <laughs> you know, it's... Um, so I really don't have many examples, except I do have Ruth. And I just went down there, and I mean, she had us dressed up in Halloween costumes, dancing with awareness. And, and you know, sort of like the Zen master, you know, she'll, she'll just say, where's your body? You know what I mean? And everybody go, you know, like that. I mean, so, so there are practices I think we could cultivate as sagas to, but I think we're going to have to do it to some degree, you know, to do this kind of thing. I think just where, where can exhilaration come into Buddhist practice? I don't see it, frankly. And that's, that's, a, that's a grave concern of mine. That's a grave concern of well, I think my only answer, I'd like to hear from others, but I think it's just simply because it's difficult. You know, it's difficult. Just like sex is a difficult issue, you know, moving around really fast with a lot going on is difficult to remain focused. I mean, I think it's really that simple. That would be my idea. And so we're, you know, sort of steered in a different direction. I will say, though, um, Thich Nhat Hanh's retreats, I don't know how many of you have been on them, but um, I've only been on one. But I experienced that, and even his one day at Spirit Rock, if you can do that, does have a very joyous quality to it. It's 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 quiet, but there is getting there singing. I mean, you know, when Sister Chong Kung sings across the hillside, I mean, I'm enraptured, you know. And um, you know, Betsy Rose will lead us in certain songs. You know, that one breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. I am. What is it? Uh, blooming like a flower, you know, it's getting there. <laughs> and then they have hand movements, right? It's, it's um, I am free, I am free, I am free. You know, and when you've got a thousand people doing that, you know, that's... So I see that that's a movement in that direction. It's also very skillful, you know? Yeah. You know, we have, we've had, uh, we've been having retreats GBF has been having retreats for the last seven, six or seven years, I think. 
and uh, they were they started out being silent retreats and uh, totally silent retreats, and then there was a, a lot of that dissatisfaction with that, and we started having retreats where there's uh, silence in the morning and then talking the rest of the day, and. Um, that became a very successful formula. That's what mm-hmm. we do now, mm-hmm. and um, and we've our retreats actually have been they they have been very I think they've been very joyful and and um, they've been wonderful. And I think the reason is because we have somehow managed to create a space where people can open their hearts, mm-hmm. and that's really what this is all about. I mean, that's what all this practice is, what the songs, what the, you know, all that is about is having a place where people's hearts are open to each other. And that's what, um, anyway, that's... uh, Yeah, um, I want to say something about that because um, I can only talk again from my experiences, but um, I try, we try to stay away from talking (laughs) except in small groups, you know, when there's a focused discussion. And I don't know if that's the kind of talking you mean, but any other kind of talking, talking at meals, um, talking on the path, you know, when we're taking a break, whatever, I find does does um, have a way of distracting. That's all I can say. Again, it's, it's just my limited experience and, and the sort of the general feeling of the sangha, but... Um, it just does. And maybe it's because women, you know, don't, don't talk anyway. I mean, you know, who knows what we're talking about here. But I really find that. And, and so on one hand, although there was that question about wanting more interaction on in some way, I think what they were really saying is they just wanted to be acknowledged, you know, or a hug or maybe they're or bowed to or uh, something. And I wouldn't go without the small groups, though. I mean, they're absolutely essential because stuff comes up and we need to, to share it. No, I, I uh... First of all, I don't agree with you. I don't. You don't agree with you? No, I, I think it is distracting, and I haven't oh. enjoyed it. The, uh, I, and yeah. I understand also that many people agree with you about that. I have found mm-hmm. it distracting. Uh, and, so, and I was curious about hearing the focus groups. Is, is that sort of where, where three or four people just yeah. visit? Uh, mm-hmm. And just how the practice is going, and, and, and how this experience is for them right then and exactly. there? Exactly. Mm-hmm. That. Right. That and it can get into issues because the issue came up. Like their experience right then and there was that they felt it was cold and people weren't looking at them. So we kind of explored the whole thing. Yeah. But when the group, like of an hour or so, whatever was over, then it, it, people left silently. Yeah, you I know. Like but I think, you know, we can, we can do whatever we want. We can do what works, you know. But it's, I'm so happy that we're exploring this. That's the most important thing. Yeah. I want to comment and go back to uh, the the earlier topic, and uh, this is all just sort of like jelly at this point, so I may be confused. But it, it seems to me that there is a way of looking at Buddhism that there's there's two kinds of issues which apparently come up. Well, I'm not sure that the Buddha meant us to focus on both of those. One is pain and suffering, and the other is nirvana. Mm-hmm. And when we can focus on uh, problem removal, pain reduction, Mm -hmm. then that's limited. Mm -hmm. We we may need to do that. Mm -hmm. And when we focus on growth, seeking the light, Mm -hmm. uh, joy, beauty, nirvana, tranquility, uh, various terms for it, then it seems to me that that's a uh, I, I never know what verse to use a more desirable approach yeah. you know, uh, it's not really uh, uh, I know what you're saying. a further approach mm-hmm. um, and, and where I came to this was the work of Abraham Maslow and probably a lot of people mm-hmm. know here and it's, it's interesting that Maslow's work which was about, about levels of uh, desire, if you like, at the lowest level being psychological, mm-hmm. and the next one being safety, the next one being social relationships, yeah, the next one this. being self-esteem, and the highest one being the sort of vague term of self-actualization, which mm-hmm. could be described as sort of they're seeking the light. Uh, and there's been some further, and one, one thing that's in, interesting about Maslow's work is that he, 
He is reputed, though, actually, it's not quite true, but to have said you do one at a time and you don't go to the next one before you finish off the other one. Uh, and there's been considerable research that shows that that's not very true and so forth, so we're sort of been reputed. And everybody still accepts it. So, and it's still in all the texts and so forth. So it, it seems to me that there's something that's there. And what Maslow said that he was interested in doing, as, as I understand it, was that psychology had focused on removing deficiencies uh, on problem solving, and that he was looking at uh, ways towards moving towards an ideal or growth or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And for myself, to go back to my own experience, um, I know that I certainly spend a great deal of time focusing on problems, uh, pain, solving problems. And it seems to me it also connects with the materialism in our society that a lot of that is about problem removal. Um, if we just had a washing machine, we wouldn't have to you know, do it in the stream and then, then our life would be perfect. Uh, if we just had a cell phone and we didn't have to go and you know, answer at the booth, it, it would be perfect. Um, but it doesn't seem to work that way. similarities of orgasm between men and women. I wrote a poem uh, based on a caption I saw in Omni a long time ago, a long time ago, that said uh, uh, women achieve during orgasm the state of certain mystics and saints while men reach the level of marmosets and lower animals. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that again? Because I didn't know your ears. No, I want to hear it again. Women say it during, slowly. Yeah. Women during orgasm achieve the states of certain saints and mystics, while men achieve the state of marmosets and other lower mammals. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a poem about it. In the poem, I investigate that. And in fact, I come to the conclusion that because of our physiology, men come out and women come in. And I think that um, it becomes very confusing for men and isolating for men because there's this equipment that's out there mm -hmm. and there's this stuff that, pro that it explodes out and one can say, that's that, and walk away, which is a very frustrating experience for the self mm -hmm. and quite frequently for the other who is involved. Mm -hmm. And leads to activities like tea rooms and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The whole, the whole gay sex thing. But when the... Um, and there is overlap. When the... <laughs> no graphic to get it, This explosion occurs, is, is there not a sense of, of, of immersion, you know, into other? And you have 30 people to ask. If you're asking me... Yeah, I'm going to say... If you're asking me, um, there is... A, there is it, it changes. Sometimes... Masturbation can be used, you know, it's a quick fix. I'm nervous, let's get it out. Right. Kaboom, yes. you're done. Yeah. And then it's that, what's next? It says, oh, that didn't, that's gone, that's done. What's next? Now I can move on. I think that's a very frustrating thing for partners of men, including male partners of men. Sure. That, you know, you have this, because it can release tension, release nerves, and give you a chance to go, oh, great, now I'm ready for, um, you know, next bit of my work of the day. And because it's easy, you know, sort of like, you know, we take it out in PP, we can take it out in the <laughs> So that's, you know, I think that... That's interesting. I, but I do think that there's, if you're asking me personally, yes, there is a time when I get that oceanic, Freud's oceanic feeling, but it's, it takes a long time and it'll be long to, to tell you about it. And it involves drugs as well. It involves some marijuana to go... And, and also involves a feeling of realization that, that, that I'm not Safety. blah, 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 blah. And safety. <clears throat> if, if I were to hear your, your lecture again, uh -huh. where I'd really love to hear you start is with the question, what is pleasure? Uh -huh. Because for me, that is a, that's a question. Uh, with my survival work, which is a, a bank waiter, there's, no pro there, there's a problem in the sense that 
Oh, great, yeah. None of this work. What is pleasure? A drink is pleasure. Anything nice. away from mm -hmm. here is pleasure. With my other work, I'm a writer. It becomes more confusing. How I'm reading, reading, writing, writing, but I also find pleasure in reading, reading, writing, writing. What do I do? How do I deal with solitude? How do I deal with affiliation? I think, I mean, in fact, I'm asking you that question now. What, what is pleasure? Well, um, this is a good question. I think we could all ask ourselves, but um, pleasure is just simply a sensation, right? doesn't matter, and it comes through one of the six sense doors of our body. So if we're writing, pleasure could be, you know, a, a pleasurable thought or an experience, you know, bringing something through finally on the paper or whatever. It's, um, it's just a response. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, a, it's a reaction, positive or negative, a like or dislike. It's when contact hits the sense door and we react. It's just who we are. It's, it's the driving life force. You know, we move towards pleasure because pleasure theoretically will um, keep us alive. You know, and that's the trick. That's the trouble, right? <laughs> it's a survival. I like to use that word. But, you know, it's set that way. In order to live, we have to seek pleasure. In other words, food and shelter, basic needs, right? But then if we get clean, caught up in it, then we suffer. So we have, we have very levels of pleasure. It's all that. It's, it's okay to have pleasure. It's just a matter of attaching to it. And some of the pleasures you named probably are much more seductive, right? And much more like alcohol, obviously, you know, than writing. And also much more health producing, perhaps, writing. I don't know. Does anybody resonate to what is pleasure? <laughs> yeah? I have one thought. Um, I'm a musician and a pianist, and uh, I start my practice practice in the morning after my sitting. So I start the practice from um, silence, complete silence. Um, and the moment of beginning, there's a couple of things that happen. First, there's a, uh, there's a physical pleasure just of beginning the process of pushing things down. And the physical motion, again, the relumbering, re-happening. That's, of course, that, that, that's one. There's a second one, which is the, the uh, pleasure in sound. It's happening again. It's been quiet. Now it's happening again, and the sound is coming out, and that's a pleasure. Those are now those are happening at that, but then beneath that, there is something else happening, which I'm not sure is a pleasure or a, a communication with something larger, and that is the recommunication with music and its history and its world. Um, starting your day out in the morning by sitting down and playing a Bach prelude is not just playing a Bach prelude; it's <laughs> communicating with something great and universal. So past the pleasures, the physical pleasures of just doing it, there is that sense of the larger. And I, I think in some ways we can, we can make that happen in other aspects of our lives as well. Perhaps music is just a particularly intense uh, experience along those lines. Okay. Yeah, nice. Question. Okay. Uh, I have two things I want to say, and they're different, but I'll show it this one. Um, the, I think what's astounding at Buddhism is um, that this posture of the, the Buddha statue here uh, is, is an expression of bliss and joy and peace and equanimity and fulfillment. And it is just so natural and so unmoving and not doing any activity that I think there comes to mind, uh, when you look at it, you might be misled to think it has to be inacti in inactivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You will find this bliss and this joy. But I think that the iconography of Buddhism is just saying it doesn't depend on any particular activity to have this bliss and this joy. Any activity, even sitting quietly under a tree, can bring pure bliss. So you are free to, to, to do this blissful activity. And the, the suggestion is, well, why don't you have your activity be awakening other beings, you know, to this truth. So that when you come into alignment, your, your greatest joy and your bliss is, is this helpful activity. And you kind of got me. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please 
Subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.